Uh, it's a great privilege and a joy to uh, welcome Doreen Irvin uh, to us tonight. And uh, she is going to give her testimony. It's a testimony that uh, some of you would have possibly read about through her book, From Witchcraft to Christ. We praise God for what that book has done for many people throughout the world, not only in this country, but throughout the world. Many have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus, delivered from darkness into his most marvelous light as a direct result of that. And so over now to uh, Doreen, who's going to give us her testimony of how she came to know Jesus and something of her background prior to that. Thank you for your welcome. Um, I just want to read from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. As not raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of work, least any man should boast. The Lord will add his blessing to his word. Just before I give my testimony uh, this evening, I... I want you to join me for a moment's prayer. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity of witnessing again to your glory. And I pray, Lord, that you'll captivate my thoughts and bring everyone into the obedience of your will, that your name will be glorified, that your face will be seen, that your voice will be heard. Lord, tonight, in the name of Jesus, I come against all the powers of darkness, and I thank you, Lord, for surrounding this place with a wall of fire, and I thank you, Lord, for peace and love and joy in the Holy Spirit. And I thank you, Lord, for the victory in the name of Jesus. Speak to each heart, Lord. Help me, Lord Jesus, sir, as I endeavor to witness again for your glory. Thank you, Lord, for your strength and love tonight and victory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I just want to quote two scriptures before I give my testimony tonight. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man or any woman, that means anyone, if anyone be in Christ, is a new creature, old things are passed away. Um, behold, all things are new. And tonight I'm going to speak about some of the old things in my life that belong to the world, the flesh and the devil. But it's not to glorify the devil, but to expose the devil and all his works. It says in Revelation 12, verse 11, which is the second scripture, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And now every time you give a personal testimony, no matter where it is, in the school, in the shop, on the street, in the church, in the hospital, in the home, whenever you give a personal testimony to the glory of God, you're overcoming the devil. The devil hates it when he sees a child of God given a personal testimony to his glory. And it's not to give glory to the devil that I'm speaking about um, my life before I was a Christian. I want to show you how powerful Jesus is and how merciful Jesus is and how pure and kind he is. I want to show you to what depth Jesus can and he does stoop to lift fallen men and women up. I give my testimony because I love Jesus very much. He's forgiven me much, 
so I love him much. That's why I give my personal testimony. It's not what I was in the past that matters. It's not what I was last week. It's what I am today. It's what I am now in 1986 that matters. And I am what I am only by the grace and by the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to speak about some of the old things in my life. The world, the flesh and the devil. Then I'm going to come to the new things, which are far better. I was born in the East End of London, so I'm a true Cockney. So if I drop my H's here and there, you'll know the reason why. I was born the oldest of five girls. My father I love with all my heart, but he spent most of his life in the pub. I never saw my mum without cuts and bruises, a victim of my father's brutality. Nevertheless, I loved him with all my young cockney heart, and if anyone said anything bad about my dad, I wouldn't think twice about something him on top of the nose. I loved him, he was my dad, and that was it. Uh, to say that we were poor is an understatement of the century. There was no beds to sleep in. My bed and my sister's bed was a pile of dirty old coats on the bare floorboards upstairs. Um, we never sat down to a meal. There was no carpets, no curtains, or anything like that. I was brought up rough and tough in a home with a great many problems. But I was born with a good sense of humour, and thank God for a good, clean sense of humour. Isn't that the gift of God? Surely the Lord knows how much we need a, a good, clean sense of humour, especially when you're working for the Lord. Believe me, you do need a sense of humour. And I was born with it, and it got me over many a style then, and it gets me over many a style today. And I was mother and father to my young sisters, and all the other grimy kids on the council estate where I was brought up. I never went to day school. Um, I had to stay at home because there was no shoes to wear, and I'm not exaggerating, there's no shoes to wear. And, and when I was sent to school, on a rare occasion I was sent to school, often the nurse used to come round looking in our heads, you know, for fleas. Nitty Nora, I called her. I hated her, and uh, they all sent me home because I had fleas in my head, and I was called names like Yellow Teeth, Ragamuffin, Gypsy, and all the rest of it. And so I hardly ever went to school in the week. And I didn't care because I hated the teachers because they didn't understand my problems. And they were as bad as the other children and held us up in ridicule in front of them. But on Sunday, I went to Sunday school. Now that was different. You see, if I had a bad, unhappy time at home in the week, I took it out on the Sunday school teachers on Sunday. Now, I didn't go around to Sunday school because mother and father were religious or anything like that. You see, Dad came home drunker than ever on Sunday. And so we were only too glad to get out of his way and we were sent there to get out of his way on a Sunday. And so uh, when Doreen and her band of followers, about 30 of us, marched in on Sunday afternoon, battle commenced. I put my own words to the hymns uh, and to the choruses and I generally made the life of the Sunday school teachers uh, pretty impossible. I always remember the Sunday school superintendent standing up on a Sunday afternoon and he said, every afternoon I have a headache and he looked straight at me. Yeah. And often we were turned out for bad behaviour. But you know, no matter how many times we were turned out for bad behaviour on Sundays, the door was always open for us to go back the next week. And I thought it was well worthwhile putting up with a bit of religion just to get some cakes and, and lemonade at the end of the meeting. And besides, there were the parties to look forward to, and the outings, I wasn't going to miss them. There was precious little else to look forward to. And so there I first heard the stories of Jesus. There the seed was sown in my young heart. Now listen, no Sunday school teachers, they may have thought that they were wasting their time but, you know, I believe that the seed was sown there. And no matter where I went or what I did after that, that seed was planted. And God saw that it was watered, and God saw that it grew, and it did produce fruit, even though it was years and years later. So Sunday school teachers, youth workers here, look up, cheer up, and keep on sowing those seeds. I believe the work of the Sunday school is the most important work of the church today and it should not be the poor work the cinderella of the church i'm glad i went to sunday school um when the war got worse and worse you know the rows and fights in the home that was always happening 
instead of centering around money and beer, now centered around a strange new woman. My father had found himself another woman at the pub. And my mum, she put up with poverty, she put up with beatings for years. But another woman, it broke her heart. And my fears grew of the possible family collapse. It wasn't much of a family, uh, but it was the, all I had. And I was afraid it was all going to break up. And my mum, she tried to cut her wrist with razor blades, uh, and she tried to drown herself in the canal. And one day, on one of the rare occasions I did go to school, I came home in the dinner hour and found a note on the table, but I couldn't read it. But with the help of the neighbour, uh, I, re I read, um, Dear Dolly, Mum's gone away. She's not coming back anymore. Be a good girl. Don't cry, love Mum. Don't cry. I put my head down on that rough wooden table and I wept and wept for the mother that I've never seen since. And at the young age of 11, a great bitterness entered my young heart. And I was determined then, right then, to get my own back on the rotten old world that we lived in, as I, as I called it. My father brought the other woman home to take my mother's place. She had two children and expecting another one. More responsibility was placed upon my shoulders, and by the time I was 14, I was certainly old beyond my years. Dave Wilkinson, who wrote the book The Cross and the Switchblade, also wrote another book called Born Old. Well, that was me. And I was to leave school where well, I hardly ever went anyway. What was I going to do? I could hardly read and write. I could just read it and hand and two, and that was it. I had no education. I wasn't stupid. In fact, I was very quick and bright and intelligent. But I just didn't have the chances that other young people had. And so I didn't know what I was going to do when I left school. But here at the Sunday school, the little old mission hall, came in and they helped find me a job. And I was to leave home that I was brought up in. Leave the hovel. Leave the squalor. And train to become a serving maid in the neighbouring village of Cowley. Well... I packed all my possessions in my little paper carrier bag. I didn't have any clothes other than what I had on my back, and they seemed to last for years. I don't know how, but they did. And the only present I ever received as a child, a golden bells in book. That was given to me by the Sunday school for good attendance. Not good behaviour, good attendance. I said goodbye to my band of followers, and I was out in the world all alone. I got to the large house situated in its own grounds, I gulped a bit, walked down the drive, and knocked at the door. An elegant lady answered the door, looked down at me, didn't recognise a new maid, and said, um, yes, can I help you? I said, I'll come to be the new maid. Oh, she said, have you? Well, you'd better come in. So I walked into this very large hall, bigger than this room. Wide eyes and open mouths at the luxury that I saw, and it was only in the hall. And when she took me up the, the staircase and showed me my own bedroom with my own bed with, uh, with real sheets on it, a carpet on the floor, a sink in the corner, a wardrobe, and next door my own bathroom, I thought I'd arrived, I'd arrived in heaven at last. The place had been singing about at the Sunday school for so many years. She asked me when my luggage would be arriving. I said, eh? Hey, what luggage? I didn't have any luggage. She knew I'd come from a poor home, but what she didn't know was how poor. And she could hardly believe that her, her new maid was all but destitute. Well, life in um, domestic service began. Now, first of all, she had to buy me some new clothes, which she did the next day. And that was on top of my free uniform, which I thought was pretty good anyway. Well, my first job was to cut some bread for the evening meal. I did, about four inches thick, and slumped it on the plate. I couldn't understand why they didn't like the look of them. They looked all right to me, and I said so. The cook who'd been with the family for about eight years said she never laughed so much in all her life. She died a bit later. <laughs> Everything I seemed to do, and I was try to, tried to, you know, be, I was willing, and I tried to please the lady. Everything I did went wrong. 
Take, for instance, that hall floor that I came in that hall floor, out of polish that. There was no polisher, you know, I had to use a, the, the two rags that, and the bits in a mansion polish. And she told her, I've got to put it on with one cloth and take it on with, off with the other. I thought, well, that's easy enough. The more you put on, the more it would shine. So I slapped it on enthusiastically, making it shine like Wembley skating rink. And uh, just as dangerous, so she soon discovered as she came sliding across the hall on a small run. You can imagine what I said when she said, I've got to get down and scrub it all off again. Well, I did, but not without some few choice swear words from the back street to express how I felt. But I'd never met anyone quite like the new maid. I'd turned that well-ordered household into chaos within a few short days. Um, she tried to um, show me um, how to do things, but everything seemed to, to go wrong. Um, I love the cook. Now, she took the place of my mum in my young heart, you know. And uh, when she did die, um, I really did break my heart. She taught me how to read. Do you know that she taught me how to read? In three months, I could read and write anything. Why? Because she had patience and because she had love. But before she died, you know, even though I was in domestic service now, um, I, I, I was still lonely, you know. And there was nowhere to go on my one half day off a week. And... I know what it was like to be lonely from a very, very early age. And when a cook died, I was lonelier still. Yeah. But uh, before that, you know, there were some times of, of laughter and, and things like that. So she asked me once um, just to open the front door and show the guest into the living room. I thought, well, that's simple enough, you know. So I opened the door with great gusts and said, come in and wipe your feet. <laughs> <laughs> I had a fear of the telephone, but she was, she was going to make quite sure I overcame the fear of the phone. And she taught me how to answer over and over and over again. So she thought, I've really got it in my head. And then one day she said to me, now answer the phone that I've told you. So the phone rang. And she said, if it's Mrs. Winters, tell her that I'm not in today. I don't want her to see her today. So I picked up the receiver, balled into the mouth, said, hello. The voice at the other end said, this is Mrs. Winters speaking. I said, oh, is it? Well, madam's just told me to tell you she's not in. <laughs> she never asked me to answer the phone again. That was my life in domestic service. Times of loneliness, times of laughter. Life's like that, isn't it? But after um, a little while in domestic service, about nine months, I decided that a cook was dead now. I decided that I'd had enough. I was going to run away like my mum, go to London where I was born, because we've been evacuated in the war, it's 16 miles away. I was going to go to London, buy a big house, get all the kids together, and we were going to all live happily ever after in this big house. I said nothing to nobody, I didn't give them notice or anything. I walked out, I had a few more possessions than what I started out with. I got on the train, got off at Paddington. No bed to go to, no job to go to this time. Well, I, I wasn't worried. I walked around the back street till it was dark and someone directed me to a back street tenement slum and I paid my first week's rent in advance for a room that was very different from the warm, pretty little room I'd just left behind in domestic service. It was too late now to turn around and go back. I'd done it. I'd run away. And so many people today, especially young people, they run away. You know, no matter, no matter where you run, you take your problems with you. And, well, the girls around me that occupied these rooms around me were self-confessed prostitutes. But, you see, they took an interest in me. They had hearts of gold, some of these prostitutes. They were given their last penny away. They, they used to help old ladies across the road. And they were kind to animals and they were kind to children. They took an interest in me. And, well, to, to cut a long story short, I joined the ranks of the women of the twilight at the age of 14 and was probably one of the youngest prostitutes uh, on the streets of London at that time. But I was still unhappy and I was still miserable. I got plenty of clothes and plenty of friends but I was still unhappy. I used to think, oh well one day I'd meet a man who'd rescue me from that life, you know, come up charging along on a big white horse, you know, and rescue me and we'd live happy ever after. But it didn't turn out that way. I came in contact with the Salvation Army as they preached the gospel on the street. And when I listened to what they were saying, my conscience was pricked because I'd heard it all before in Sunday school, you see. So to cover up my feelings of guilt, 
I used to make fun of them as they preached the gospel on the street. And I used to, you know, do it to have a bit of fun at, at their expense, but it didn't seem to make any difference to them. The more I ridiculed them, the more fervent they became. I thought the drum was going to bang a hole right through the middle of that drum. He was so fervent. One night, though, while all alone, with no friends to impress, it was early on a Sunday evening, I came across another Salvation Army open air, and a young girl, she stood in the centre of the ring, and with a face shining like an angel, she sang, My father is rich with houses and land. He holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands, of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold. His coffers are full. He has riches untold. I'm a child of a king. I'm a child of a king. With Jesus, my saviour, I'm a child of a king. And there I was, with plenty of money in the bank, plenty of jewels and all the rest of it, and I knew I was poor in comparison to this girl. She had something that money could never, never buy. Real joy, peace and happiness. And I walked side their way thinking, well, it's all right for them. They're nice people, respectable people. They've never lived the kind of life I live. You see, I thought that Christianity was a matter of being good rather than being made good. You see, I didn't know this, uh, what Jesus said. I didn't know these words. I'd come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repent. And I didn't know the truth of these words, though I'd heard them in Sunday school. I didn't know the truth of them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever, whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that word whosoever meant prostitute, queen, prince, beggar, president, black, white. It meant me. But I didn't realise the truth of those words, but I realise the truth of those words today. And I love them. They're very, very real to me. Well, later on I saw another part of London, the, the West End, and um, to cut a long story short, I gave up my, um, my squatty bed dip. I got a job in a strip club, and I was known as Daring Diana. It suited me. Good for a laugh and a song, that was me. But, you know, right in the middle of my act in the club, Right in the middle of it all, I feel completely and utterly isolated, and I think, is this why I was born? Is this it? And sometimes, right in the middle of my act, one of the causes I've heard in Sunday school would fly to my mind, words like this, wide, wide as the ocean, high as the heavens above, deep, deep as the deep as sea is my Savior's love. I am so unworthy, still I'm a child of his care, for his word teaches me, that his love reaches me. Everywhere. Everywhere. You know that Jesus was trying to reach me, was trying to win my black and simple heart, even in a, a place like that. Isn't the love of Jesus wonderful? Because he can reach anyone anywhere, and he, he can speak to them anywhere, no matter where they are. And the word of God says his eyes go back and forth, to and fro throughout the whole earth. And there's nothing that he doesn't care about. There's nothing that he doesn't see. His eye of love pierces into every grimy, dark corner. And he saw me where I was. And do you know what I think of that today? It makes me love him even more. Because he loved me and he, and he wooed me even long, long before I knew him. And when I was um, there, um, I've got a flat now, a luxurious apartment in Mayfair. Um, plenty of money as a, as a, a striptease artist. And um, extra money as a cool girl. Not the streets now. A high-class prostitute now, a cool girl, you can call it high-class. I was still as lonely and as lost as ever. And I know that money cannot buy happiness. And it was then I got hooked on drugs. It seems like one step after another, prostitution, strip is now drugs. Well, I got hooked on first what they called reefers in those days, and I had plenty of money to buy them. Nobody warns me about the dangers of drug addiction and taking drugs. But you know today, young people are warned by the media of television, by literature, in the school. Every way they're warned and yet they still go headlong into a life of sheer hell. Sheer hell. So I warn today about drugs. Keep away from them. They're killers. And uh, I started smoking um, uh, reefers. And the same um, man that peddled me these reefers introduced me to heroin. 
He said, I've got something stronger for you than that. Are you interested? Well, of course I was interested, you know? I was lonely and, and miserable. And he said, follow me. And I followed him into one of the many bookshops in Soho. And he said, um, it will mean a little prick in the arm. You know, some of these bookshops are a cover-up for what goes on at the back. And uh, I said, right, I said, do it quick then. So he rolled up my uh, sleeve and he tied a tawny case and he put a needle straight in my main vein near my elbow and within minutes I was as high as the sky and I thought, this is it, this is it. You know, I thought, well, it wasn't such a bad old world, you know, where the skies were blue and the birds were singing. But it didn't last. It didn't last. Some hours later, this feeling of well-being and security, it started to ebb away slowly. And I started to be filled with an awful dark depression. And it was worse than that. And I didn't understand it. I was depressed before. And, but now I was more depressed. And I started to weep and I started to cry and I started to wail. And I walked about and I, I was so restless and agitated and I dragged myself along to the club where I was supposed to be performing that night. And I collapsed a shivering, crying heap on the floor. The girls ran and got the pusher. And he came when he was ready. And he just looked down coldly and unsympathetically at me. And he said to me, you're all right, you just need some more drugs. Have you got any money for it? And it was not until he knew I had money did he give me another fateful fix in the arm to make me so-called okay. I was hooked. After one small prick in the arm, mind you, it was a massive dose. And in the days that followed, I relied more and more on the drugs to get me through each awful day. Every time I met the drug pusher, the, the price of the drugs that went up. And my bank balance came down, and so did my health. And I was issued an ultimatum. Get yourself right or get out. Now, how could I get myself right? I didn't know how to. So I was literally kicked out of the club. Now, I had to go on the streets, whether I wanted to or not. And believe me, I didn't. I was too ill. But I had no alternative. I had to have drugs, and drugs were expensive. And I sold everything I had. I sold curtains, I sold clothes, I sold jewellery. I sold furniture. I sold everything I possessed for money, for more drugs, drugs, drugs. And when everything else had gone, I went shoplifting. Now, when I was a little girl, I often went shoplifting just to get something to eat for us for the day. Sausages from the, from the butchers and cakes from the cake shop. But this was something bigger than that. And uh, I got quite uh, confident about it and I got away with it for some time, you know. But one day, I was a bit too daring and I was caught red-handed. Not one of my so-called friends were in the courtroom when I was sentenced to three months in Holloway Prison. You know what they say, don't you? You know your friends when you're in trouble? Well, where were mine now? Nowhere to be seen. I was taken along to the prison. The doctor looked at my arms and he looked at my notes and he looked at my eyes and he said, I'll see you're an addict. He said, you'll be looked after in the hospital wing. I thought, oh, good, good. Going to tuck me up now in a nice warm bed, give me a nice hot water bottle, and they're going to look after me now. Instead of that, they pushed me into a padded cell. Even the floor was padded, and I, and I could barely stand up. And I said, here, yeah, I'm not mad. Come back, come back. But it was too late, because they'd gone, and I thought they'd thrown away the key. And I was soon to find out why I was in a padded cell. Although it was a hospital wing, there was no drug. And there was no compensating medication to help me through the hell of withdrawal. Have you ever seen a hard drug addict withdraw from drugs? It's not a very pretty sight. I saw things, I heard things. The whole prison turned into a monster that, that clawed at my body. I tried to get the padding from the walls. I even tried to pray. I thought about Sunday school. I thought about the Sunday school teachers. I thought about God. And I wondered if there was a God. And whether he could hear me through the thick padded walls. So I tried to pray and say, God help me, please help me and let me die, let me die, let me die. And I wondered if he could hear me. Well, I know now that he did, he did hear me. Because you see, he didn't let me die. He let me live. Because he knew that one day he's going to save me. Clean me up, make me a new creature 
and used me for his glory. Yes, Jesus heard me through the thick padded walls. And when I came out of prison, I vowed I was going to live a good life. No more prostitution, no more drugs. That was going to settle down, you know, turn over a new leaf. And within a few short months, you know, my resolutions lay in ashes around my feet. And I wondered why I was back on the cl in the club and I was back on drugs. Why? I'll tell you why. I tried to change myself. So many people try it today, don't they? They tried changing themselves. Even Christians try changing themselves. They say, we Doreen, I wish I could pray more. I wish I could, you know, uh, read my Bible more. I, I wish I had a burden for the lost. I, I keep failing, Doreen. I, what can I do? There's only one thing you can do. You've got to rely on the Lord and you've got to fix your eyes on Jesus. You can't change yourself. Only he can change you. And I tried to change myself. And I was back where I started from. You know, the devil is a dirty worker, isn't he? When he sees a person down, he pushes them down further. And that's what he did to me. Think that was dark? I was to go into greater darkness than that. That's dark enough, but I was to go into greater darkness than that. You know, there's darkness and darkness. I got involved in witchcraft and Satanism. How did I get involved in that? Well, nobody came around the streets with pamphlets saying, come to the next Satanist meeting. It was a secret order. So how did I get involved in it? Well, a couple of girls at the club were Satanists. And I overheard them speaking, which wasn't very difficult in the semi-darkness of the club without being seen. And I heard things about the Satanist temple and I was curious and I wanted to know more about it. So one night I said, here, what's all this about the Satan in this temple then? The Satan worship. And they wouldn't tell me. They clammed up like that. But you see, I kept on and they thought I'd heard more than what I had done. I'd only heard snatches of the conversation, but they thought I heard all of it. But they reluctantly agreed to take me along to the Satan in this temple the very next season. They said, be outside at six o'clock. I was there. So were they. Only this time there were shows for driven. And uh, the chauffeur got out and said, you still want to go to the Satanist temple? I said, yes. He said, I'll pin. He said, you'll have to wear blindfold because the situation of the temple was a secret. And especially uh, to newcomers, it was a secret. I didn't mind. It added to the excitement as far as I was concerned. And you know, the main element in the pool towards occult practices today it's this element of excitement and intrigue and mystery. Everybody wants a little bit of excitement, don't they? Something mysterious. Something spooky. You know, and Satan sees to it, they, they get signs that they're looking for. Do you know, in the Bible, they ask for signs for Jesus. They have the audacity to say to the King of Kings and the Messiah, if you are the Christ, show us a sign. What did he say? He said, no sign shall be given you except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So it was the same then. It was the same in those days. People wanted signs. And I wanted something different. Something to, you know, cultivate the senses. The same today. People are lonely. People are confused. Unemployment. And, uh, and family collapse. And, and every other tragic circumstance that is pulling people towards these things. And I got to the Satanist temple that night and they took off the blindfold and I was surprised, to say the least, that I was at the back of about 400 people. And they didn't have comfortable seats to sit in. When they worshipped the devil, they stood for hours. No seats in the Satanist temple, only one. Everybody prostrated themselves on the ground and worshipped the devil. Effigies of Satan hung round the walls, half man, half beast, cloven and hooves and horns. At the front, there was a, a real altar and one throne-like seat, beautifully carved with snakes and dragons and flames of fire. And around the, the robed and hooded figure that sat on the throne-like seat, 
were 13 priests and priestesses of the highest, the most ancient order of Satanism in the entire world. Their rites, their rituals, their evil writings and their evil books in the evil temples date back centuries. You see, witchcraft, Satanism, occult practices is not known. It was with us long, long before the flood. And that's why God warns of that in the Bible. And he says, do not have anything to do with it. Deuteronomy 18 and other parts of the scripture, God forbid all occult practices. Why? Because there's a call forbidding God? No. It's because he's a kind and loving God. And he only wants the best for the creation that he made. And so in love he said, thou shalt not do these things. It's not new. People um, think it's new because we see it increasing around us every day. More and more people are getting intrigued and getting involved in, in occult practices. And it's springing up more and more because we are living in the last days today. And Jesus said these things will happen before we return. Wickedness will increase. And we don't have to look very far, do we, to see wickedness increasing. We only have to turn on the TV, and we only have to listen to the radio. We only have to open the papers, and we read sickening accounts of how low man has sunk. Accounts of rape and murder and child abuse, pornography. These things will increase. But thank God, we as Christians know that the coming of the Lord draws nigh. We have this hope. Christ is coming very soon. Meanwhile, the devil is very, very busy. And I learned all there was to know about this Satanist order. I learned all the rules. There's just a few. You must not read the Bible for your own edification. In fact, all religious books, Bibles, prayer books, all religious books, which is brought into the temple and burnt. And I personally have burned Bible after Bible in the white hot flames in the Satanist temple. So two huge torches crossed themselves at the Satanist uh, um, altar, high altar. And I burned Bibles in these huge torches until they disintegrated into flames, um, in, into ashes. And my hands remained in the flames unburned. That shows you how real Satan is, doesn't it? But doesn't it show you something far more important than that? Doesn't it show you how Satan hates God's word? All the more reason then that we should read God's word and believe God's word and act upon his word. They have their own Satanist book in the Satanist temple. And I, I was able to learn it from cover to cover by heart and it's about six times thicker than the average Holy Bible. Another rule is no one must be irreverent in the Satanist temple. No one was late for a Satanist meeting. If you were late or irreverent at all or broke the rule, you were uh, stripped and strapped to the whipping post and you were whipped. Nobody would dream of being late or irreverent in a Satanist temple. In fact, people were early and dedicated all uh, the temple and all the objects in the temple. You know, when I first became a Christian, in 1964, and I started to go into the Christian churches. You know, I was utterly appalled at what I saw. People coming in, you know, any old, dressed any old how, any old time, treating the hymn books and the Bibles like they were yesterday's newspapers, going in and out of the meeting, banging the door. It will never be allowed in the Satanist temple, and there they're worshipping the devil. Now, I'm not suggesting that we creep about God's house in fear because we serve a God of love. But I'm suggesting that we treat God's house with reverence and respect. Because Jesus said, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So there was no disrespect in the Satanist temple. Um, when I learned all the rules, I was ready to become a fully fed Satanist. Only the, uh, the high priests and priestesses were there because you couldn't get all the Satanists into one temple. What, uh, the biggest temple was um, at Brighton and it held 700 people. And you couldn't get all the Satanists in there. So only the most important people were there, initiations. Um, 
the evil ceremony began, the great wow to the devil, the great god of darkness, death and mystery, Lucifer as we called him. And the air was heavy with evil. They went out, the two of the high priests went out behind the black, the black drape and brought in alive a white cockerel, the symbol of denial, which has mean something to you who know your Bible. Remember when Jesus, when Peter denied the Lord, the cockerel? Well, for the Satanists, the cockerel is a symbol of denial. And they deny anything that's good and right. And, and um, they wrung its neck and they slit its throat and they caught the blood in one of the um, silver cups from the high altar. And uh, they took a knife and they stirred the, um, the blood. My arm was cut and my blood was mixed with that of the white cockerel. And I had to drink that blood. And I had to put my finger in the blood and sign myself over to Satan with my own blood on a real parchment, uh, not a scrap of paper, a real parchment. And it was stamped with the real seal of Satanism. This was regarded as a marriage to Satan, and I became Satan's bride. I had so much power as a witch and as a Satanist uh, that I became the queen of black witches. I could make myself invisible. I even made a whole covenant which is invisible one night. I was able to elevate. I was able to make things move. I was able to kill birds in flight when they were let loose from the cage. This was done in demonstration of power in front of other Satanists. Um, I saw Satan. I wasn't the only one who saw him. Oh, what does he look like, people say? Well, let me tell you, he can take on any appearance he wants to. And it's true what the Bible says. He comes as an angel of light to deceive many. So I know that Satan is real. I know how evil it all is. And I had this evil partner, such powers of which my name was put down uh, with others to compete for the title of the Queen of Black Witches of Europe, not England, Europe. It wasn't going to be an easy um, thing to gain because the other witches also had great power. And they, they came from other countries, from France, from Holland, from Germany and other countries. And uh, the ceremony um, was to be arranged on Dartmoor in Devon. And the witches, who were mostly affluent people, um, not many witches and Satanists, uh, were prostitutes or drug addicts. Um, and if they were, they were, they were what they call high-class uh, prostitutes, and in, in vice in the high-class uh, bracket, so they say. And um, they booked up the most expensive motels. And they went to great lengths. We went to great, great lengths to keep the ceremony secret and there was no time or money spared. And the greatest test of all, there were several tests, uh, um, one of them was to kill a bird in flight. Well, I could do that, but the others did that as well. But the greatest test of all was um, to walk through fire, stand in a huge bonfire. It had been prepared some days beforehand. The flames went up over 12 feet high. You had to walk into the middle of the blaze and stand there and Satan had to appear and be seen by all the other hundreds of witches to take the hand of the witch, converse with the witch, and take her through the flames unburned. I walked confidently into the flames, he appeared. There was not a smell of burning on my long flowing hair and my long black robe as I emerged the upper end. Hail Diana, Queen of the Witches, went the huge cry on Dartmoor. I travelled um, for a whole year as Queen of Black Witches to France, Holland, Germany, South Africa. I was able to converse in perfect French and teach in perfect French, perfect African, perfect German without ever learning the languages. That's how powerful Satan is. He doesn't care what kind of education you've had. All he demands, all he asks for is for your, your allegiance and he will educate you. And Satan is educating people today, and he educated me, and I educated others in the things of evil. So that's what happened to the little girl who learned the choruses in Sunday school. That's what happened to the cheeky little unteachable cockney kid who heard the stories of Jesus. How we need to pray, my friends, for our young people today. 
how we need to pray for our young people in our Bible classes and the young people in our Sunday school. How on earth then did someone like me become a Christian? Seems impossible, doesn't it? Sounds impossible, doesn't it? But what is seemingly impossible with man is wonderfully and gloriously possible with God. All things are possible with God. He died for witches and Satanists. Jesus said himself, he came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repent. And he loved me. He didn't love the sin. He didn't love what I was doing. He hates it. God hates the occult, but he hates pride as well. He hates all sin. So how did I become a Christian? Well, I was no longer the queen of that which is. I kept the title for a year. And I handed over to somebody else, although I could have kept it if I wanted it. But I was still a very powerful Satanist and, and a powerful witch. Still attending at the Satanist covens and uh, a cool girl. Still on drugs. Do you know it was a wonder that I was alive at all? Some years later it was a miracle that I was alive in 1964. And my greatest enemy and all the Satanists and witches' greatest enemy is the Christian church and the Christian message. I hated them all. I tried to put curses on people who were Christians. It didn't work and I couldn't understand it. It didn't work at all. But I hated them. And one Saturday evening, I went around Bristol Centre and I saw these posters. And on the posters, they were everywhere. It said, Eric Hutchins, come into Bristol. Thousands here in, you too, and it didn't say who he was. You know, it's just his face on the poster. And I couldn't understand who this fellow was. In fact, I thought he was an all-in wrestler when I saw him. <coughs> his photo, you know. And I went into the um, information centre and I said, um, excuse me, I said, but who is Eric Hutchins? And they said, well, we don't know, but we'll find out. And they found out and they said, oh, he's an evangelist. I said, what? I said, as if we haven't got enough people churches in Bristol. And you know, they're called Bristol City of Churches. There's one on every corner. And so I went around and I tore every poster down. And every time I, pull, I pulled one off, I saw somebody come along and put up six more. Because I was tearing them down for days, you know. And um, on one, I drew a beard on him, you know, and a moustache. And I put on it, go home, hypocrite. I felt hypocrite wrong, but... Sometime later, forgetting all about my campaign of hate, one Saturday evening, I was dressed in keeping with my profession, standing outside the Hippodrome in the centre of Bristol, waiting for a client. Very unusual. I never waited for clients. I never went out to meet them. They came to me. I did it as a special favour, and he didn't turn up. I, I was absolutely furious. I hated being kept waiting. He was late, and there I was standing waiting. And then I saw these people, and they were all making their way in one direction, and they got books under their arms, you know, Bibles, and I, and I thought, oh, Eric Hutchins has arrived, has he, this preacher fella. So I followed them, and I, I was going to go into this hall, Colston Hall, and I was determined to thump him on the nose, tell him to get out of Bristol, cause trouble in that meeting. Uh, and when I went in, well, I was outnumbered because it was absolutely packed full from, from, the, from, the, from the gallery there right down to, to the floor. And I don't know how they managed to calm me down. I can't remember how they managed to calm me down or what, what I did. I don't know. But they, they directed me to a seat right up near the wall. And I said, like, excuse me, excuse me to all these people, you know, all staring at me. And they began with this rousing him, oh, happy day, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. Well, I wasn't very happy. And I thought myself, why the am I doing in here? It's against the rules anyway. Well, it's like me, you know. I've been in some places, which is covered, hotels and luxurious motels and oh, all over the world. And now I was in a religious meeting where I shouldn't be anyway. Well, I wasn't feeling very happy. They obviously were all right. But I wasn't feeling very happy. 
I wasn't going to sing. I stood there with my head firmly still like this. And I thought, I'll wait until they finish and I'm going to get out of this meeting. And uh, it ended and they sat down. They all sat down. And I stood still standing, remained standing, and pushed my way out towards the end of the road. And when I got to the end of the road, something happened. Something happened that would ch that was to change my life. The light sort of went low, and a young girl walked towards the microphone, and with her face shining just like an angel, she sang. I'd love to tell you what I think of Jesus. Since I found in him a friend so strong and true, I would tell you how he's changed my life completely. He's done something no other friend can do. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend as kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cares for me. And I stood listening. Something was happening, and I didn't know what it was. I couldn't explain what was happening inside me. But she reminded me of the Salvation Army girl on the street of Paddington. And I could have listened if she stood and sang all night. And as she was singing about Jesus and his love, I thought about Sunday school. I thought about prison. I thought about my life as a witch and a Satanist and as a prostitute, a cool girl. And I wondered, could I have been wrong? All these years, could I be wrong? Could it be true that Jesus really lived? That Jesus really died? That Jesus really loved me? That Jesus really can change people's lives? Could it be true? And I sat down, somewhat, you know, calmer than what I'd stood up, you know, somewhat, somewhat subdued. And Eric Hutchins came forward, big man, you know, Got to be the Lord now. And he had his Bible in his hand and he strode forward. And he said, If you don't know Christ as your Saviour, you're lost. And I knew I was lost. I knew I was lost. He said, You're going down to a Christless eternity. He said, The Bible says you're dead. Spiritually dead. I read it tonight. And I knew that I was lost. And he went on and he preached a simple gospel message showing very clearly the way of salvation. Now, I don't know everything he said. I just remember that. But he showed clearly the way of salvation through the shed blood of Jesus. And at the end of the message, he made an appeal. And he said, if you don't know Christ, if you've got any questions, if, you, if you're in, if you've got problems, he said, you come forward as the choir was singing. And the choir began to sing, just as I am, without one plea but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. And people were getting up from their seats, and they were going forward to the front. And I was sitting there, and I was thinking, oh, I wish I could go. I wish I could go, if only to ask. If only to ask if it was possible, if, 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 if I could be saved. But Satan spoke suddenly. I heard him very audibly in my ear, and he spoke. And he said to me, you're mine. You can't be saved. You've given yourself to me with your own blood. Remember, you're mine. And his voice was ugly and his voice was threatening. And I felt evil powers all around. I felt demons surround me. And I felt great, big, thick, heavy chains binding me onto that seat. Physically binding me onto that seat. So then the chorus started to sing the next verse. Just as I am, thy love unknown has broken every barrier down. Now to be thine, yea, thine alone, O Lamb of God, I come. By some miracle, I was up on my feet. Satan is or chains, demons, or the devil, or, or whatever. I was up on my feet. By some miracle, I was up on my feet. And with tears streaming down my face, I made my way towards the front. You see, someone greater than the devil was there that night. And his name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He's greater than the devil. And I was saying quietly, Jesus, I'm coming, I'm coming, please take me in. And I stood at the front and I was asking Jesus to come into my heart and life and save me and change me. 
and I was weeping. I was repentant of my sin. And uh, we were counselled in the counselling room. We all had to leave the hall and go to the green room and be counselled. Well, when I got out there, the atmosphere was different to what it was where the gospel was preached. And, and the counsellor couldn't do anything with me. And, you know, I was difficult to counsel. Now, I didn't tell them that I was a witch or a Satanist or a prostitute or anything like that. Do you know why? Well, I thought they'd turn me out. Well, of course they wouldn't, but how was I to know that? How was I to know that they weren't going to turn me out? So I didn't tell them. All they knew is that I was a, someone in great need. And the council couldn't do anything with me. So he got the councillor's advisor. And he couldn't get very much further anyway. Then he went and got the advisor's advisor. And before you knew where you were, they were all around me. And Mary Hutchins, Eric Hutchins' wife, counselled me, actually. And they gave me a, a little St. John's Gospel and a little booklet called First Step with Christ. And they said I was a Christian. And that night I received Christ as my Savior. And something happened that night. That I made the first step. You know? I'd made that first step. And that was essential. You know, that first step. And I came out of the hall. And, you know, there's steps going down from, from, from Colston Hall. And, and I ran down these steps. And right there, there was a crowd of prostitutes. Just as if Satan put them there, you know? Well, after midnight it was. And they said, here, Diana, because I was known as Diana. Diana, they said, where have you been? We've been looking all over for the place for you. Do you know what I told them? I said, I've just been in there so I can give my heart to the Lord. They said, what? I said, I've been in there and I've become a Christian. I said, she's drunk. I said, well, I might have been when I went in. But I said, look, first steps with Christ. I said, um, St. John's Gospel, go on, I'm going home now, girls, to read it. Good night. Yeah, you know, I've done a wonderful thing. I confessed with my mouth the Lord Jesus. And nobody told me to do it. Nobody told me to do it. You know, now whenever I lead someone to the Lord today, I say, go and tell somebody. Tell them who they are, you know. Go and tell them. Nobody told me to do it. I was saved that night because the Bible said if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, I shall be saved. And I was saved that night in June 1964. Well, how was I going to get on now? I mean, I knew that I could not go back to the Coppins anymore. I had to give up my old life. But how was I going to do it? I didn't know. Um, I was told to find an evangelical church. And you know, I couldn't find it anywhere. I went all around Bristol looking for the evangelical church. I saw the Baptist, I saw the Methodist, I saw uh, the Salvation Army, and I thought, I was going there. But no, they said Evangelical Church. And I couldn't find it anywhere. Now, what does the word Evangelical mean to the man on the street? Or the man up the road in the pub? Absolutely nothing. Do you know, we use our evangel uh, Evangelical cliches far too often, don't we? Because it means nothing to the outsider at all. I've got a motto in my Bible, it's all over the place, K-I-S-S. -S. You know what it means? Keep it simple, stupid. And it reminds me not to be stupid. It reminds me to be simple and plain so that people can understand what I'm talking about. They should have been simple and plain, shouldn't they? Well, I couldn't find the evangelical church. I, I, one night, one Sunday night, it was about uh, a couple of weeks um, after the crusade had finished, and I was sort of a bit lost, you know. I was looking around and I thought, oh, well, I'm going into this church. This is a church that'll have to do. It's a church. It's got to be all right. And I walked in. It was full up. The only empty seats were at the front, right the front row. Nobody liked the front row in the church, you know. And they all, you know, looked very respectable, you know, and with their big hats and their pinstripe suits, and they looked very respectable and most thoroughly fed up and miserable, most of them. And it began with a very, very long, difficult hymn. You know, the... I wonder if even Orphanists knew it. Then we had a very long, difficult prayer. And then we had another long, difficult hymn to sing, even more difficult than the first one. You can believe it. 
and I had with me my St. John's Gospel, and he read something from the, from the Bible, and I was frantically searching through my St. John's Gospel. You know, it was in a, apparently found somewhere else. Nobody came with that by me. They're all staring at me. They weren't used to strangers. That was, that was absolutely apparent. So nobody came and, uh, and sat by me or made me welcome or, or anything at all. I couldn't find it anyway. I was eagerly waiting for the preacher to preach his sermon. And he got up, you know, I couldn't understand the word he was on about. Not one word. I was waiting for something like, Jesus loves you. you know? Jesus cares for you. Something simple and plain, but I couldn't. You know, it was, his, his um, sermon was full of long theological sentences. Well, I've got nothing against theology, as long as it's not frozen theology. And uh, I was glad when he came to an end. I thought, let's get out of here. And, you know, he was saying his polite farewell to his very respectable congregation. You know, good night, good night, good night, God bless you, good night, good night. I thought I'd get by him. But it was too late, he got me. And he said, good evening. I said, uh, good evening. He said, we haven't seen you before, have we? I said, no, because I haven't been here, have I? <laughs> well, when, when he got over that little shock, he said, well, what made you come along tonight? So I said, well, I went to the crusade. I said, in the centre. I said, and I gave my heart to Jesus. And he positively beamed. He beamed. You see, he loved the Lord. He knew the Lord. Just a bit stiff, I thought. And he said, can we help you on the Christian pathway? And I thought, quick. I thought, well, I do need help. More than what he realised. And I said, uh, I said, I don't know. I said, I've been a prostitute and a drug addict for 14 years. And he went as white as a sheep and nearly fell over backwards. What would have happened if I'd have told him I was once the Queen of Black Witches, eh? He would have fallen over backwards, wouldn't he? And he said very quickly, well, do come again. Good night. And I thought, come again, whatever for. They want to get rid of me as fast as they possibly could. And then began my long search. I went into one church, out of another church, into another church. I never used to stay the length of the service. And strange things began to happen in some of the churches. When the blood of Jesus was mentioned, apparently, I would scream and shout. And I'd throw Bibles and tear them up. And uh, I'd throw over communion trays when uh, they bought the bread and the wine round. Stood it all over the place, knocked the men flying. Call for commotion. Didn't realise I was doing it. Well, everybody was afraid of me. And I was even more afraid. And I went out of those places, those churches, the same way as I went in, undelivered and bound. And I didn't know what was wrong with me. I, I didn't really know what was wrong with me. And I was at the point of taking my life. No one man, he thought he knew the answer to the old, to the old situation. And he came over to me one night and he said to me, you ought to go and see a psychiatrist. So I thought, well, maybe he's right. So I went to see a psychiatrist. I paid a lot of money to see a private psychiatrist and even he needed to see a psychiatrist. All the way through the interview, he was twitching like this, like, you know. <laughs> And I was determined to get my money's worth, you know? So I told him all about myself. I'd been the queen of black witches, and I had great evil power, and I'd become a Christian. And he was shaking like a leaf, and he said, excuse me. And he opened the drawer, and he got all the glass of water, he opened the drawer, he pulled out some pills, and he swallowed a handful of pills. And it was the worst state than me after the interview. And I wondered who needed the, the psychiatrist, me or him. I didn't need a psychiatrist. Well, what was wrong with me then? Well, I was demon-possessed. My life had been an open door for demon possession. And there is the most, the, the most danger, the greatest danger of occult practices. It leads to demon possession, oppression, depression, suicide, and finally hell. That's where it leads. When Jesus was on the earth, he cast out evil spirits. 
And he let the prisoners free. He set the prisoners free. The Bible says that Jesus, the Son of God, was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. And he healed the sick. Two different ministries. Well, I was demon possessed. Now, I haven't got demon mania. I know there are people today that have. And they see the devil everywhere, you know. And they think everything's demon possession. They see uh, demons in a cat and demons in a dog and demons in a mother-in-law and demons everywhere and demons under every bush, you know. But I'm not like that. I've had good, sound teaching for a whole year in a Baptist church before I ever started to speak in public. And I have balance, and it's important that we have balance today. There's some people, they do not believe that demons exist. They don't believe the devil exists, let alone demons. And there's some people that make too much of the, of the devil and demons and give him too much glory. So you have this lopsidedness, this imbalance. And it's important that we have balance. You know, and that we accept all of God's word, not just bits of it. It's important that we embrace all the truths of God's word and not go out on a limb. But I haven't got demon mania. The fact is that I was demon possessed. But did Jesus leave me in that state of bondage? No. Because when Jesus begins a work in your heart, it says in God's word, word it'll perfect the work that is begun and Jesus didn't leave me in that state of bondage I, I was willing to be set free I wanted to be set free I wanted to be free and you must be willing and if you're willing and if the Lord done a deep work in your heart when he puts his hand upon you he'll never let you go he'll never let you go and he never left me in that state of bondage and he'll never leave anybody in that state of bondage not if they really belong to him. Not if they're really willing to be, to, to be delivered. And the Lord brought my way uh, two men. Well, three really. But the most outstanding one is the Reverend Stanley Jeb. Um, the Reverend um, Dennis Clark. Who introduced me to the Reverend Arthur Neal. And he knew at once that I was demon possessed. And he gathered other Baptist ministers around him and they fasted and they prayed and they began to cast out the demons in the all-powerful, all-worthy name of Jesus. It was a long, hard battle. Some of the demons uh, uh, fought with them and they said, I had the strength of ten men. I don't remember any exorcism at all. Um, I only uh, am repeating what they told me and they didn't tell me that straight away. The demons spoke. They argued over deep doctrinal points of the scriptures in expert Greek and Hebrew. And they tried um, to seduce the men. And the demons argued and argued and argued and fought. But praise God, Jesus Christ is victor. And Mr. Neil always kept saying, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Victor. And they cast out the demons uh, in, in different sessions uh, over the period of seven months. And after seven months, uh, one night, I always remember, it was in the Baptist Church in Bristol, in City Road Baptist Church. we have been in there some hours, and they'd been casting out the, these demons, and I don't remember that, but I remember when I was set free, the last demon that went out of my body with loud screams on its way to Gehenna, to hell. Don't cast me there, says the demons. I don't want to go to hell. Cast me to the sea. Cast me to the moon. Cast me to outer space. But don't cast me to hell. But that's where they were all cast. Because there they could not get out. They, they, there they could torment man or beast no longer. And they were all cast to hell in the name of Jesus. And as it went out with loud screams uh, on its way to Gehenna, a bright light filled that Baptist church that night, and the minister saw the light. But they didn't see who I saw, because I saw Jesus in that light. And he was standing there with his arms outstretched to me, my living saviour. 
And I knew I was his, and I knew he was mine. And I tell you, his eyes were filled with love. And I knew I was free. The Bible says, whom the sun sets free is free indeed, and I'm free tonight. Free tonight. Charles Wesley, you know, that great man of God, he sat down one night under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and he penned my testimony with these words and many others' testimonies with these words. Long my imprisoned spirit lay far bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused the quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flame with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. What lovely words. Well, I get excited about my salvation. I get so excited about my Jesus. I wish a few more people would get excited too. Then perhaps we'll see a few souls being saved and sick bodies being healed and people being set free from the power of Satan. Well, listen to the, the last verse. No condemnation now I dread. Romans 8 verse 1. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him. Alive in him. Not dead in trespasses and sins. Alive in him. My living head. And clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ mine own. Now as a witch, you know, I wore witches' robes. But now I'm a new creature in Christ. And when I was delivered, I burned all those witches' robes. I got rid of all the evil objects that I had, every single one of them. And no one did with them. I put them on a big bonfire, and I made sure it was bigger than the one where I met the devil. And I ran round that bonfire praising Jesus. You see, this new creature in Christ has new garments. Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful, not miserable, joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with a garment of salvation. And he has clothed me with a robe of righteousness. Those words thrill me. Do you know what my other robes are found? They're found in Ephesians 6. The helmet of salvation, you've got to be born again, you've got to put on salvation. You've got to put on the Lord, Jesus Christ, you've got to be made anew before you can put on the breastplate of righteousness and have your loins skirt about with your truth, with the truth, and your feet shod with the preparation. Now, is that word preparation? There's got to be preparation of heart and mind before you can bring the gospel to the lost. My feet said, uh, <laughs> my feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and the shield of faith wherewith we're able to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God new clothes for a new creature Christians have you got your armour on if you haven't got it on put it on tonight and clothed with the whole armour of God they're the new garment for the new creature. It's given me a new song. I don't wail to the devil like I did before. God forbid. It's given me a new song in my love. And I love to sing. I just love to sing the praises of Jesus. It's given me a new song. It's given me a new heart, a new spirit. Ezekiel. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I'll give you a heart of flesh. I will put my laws in your heart. And you will obey my statutes and keep them. A new heart for a new creature. You see, it was once me, me, me and what I wanted. My drugs, my life, my clothes, what I wanted. Blow you, Jack, I'm all right with my attitude once. And isn't that the attitude of the world today? But when Jesus comes, it makes a difference. Because, you see, he changes you inside. He makes you over and new. And he gave me new eyesight, new vision. You know that lovely hymn? 
Coming above the soft the blue earth around as sweet as green. Something lives in every hue. Christless eyes have never seen. Well, you know, before I knew Christ was my saviour, I didn't see the blue sky. It was always black. I didn't notice, I didn't even look. At the trees, I didn't see the green grass. I didn't see the beautiful flowers. All I could see and think about was drugs and the devil and evil things. But when Jesus set me free, I opened my eyes to the beauty all around me. And today I love to paint in oils. You know, I love to paint God's beautiful um, scenery that he puts in front of me. I love to sing his praises. You know, I opened my eyes to his beauty. He opened my eyes to people around me. And I could see the pain in people's faces. I could see the blank, empty look on people's faces. And he gave me a love for people. A great love for people. And I love people today. Do you know why? Because Jesus loves everybody, everywhere. And if only I could change people's hearts and lives, if only I could put some happiness there, if only I could take away the darkness and the pain and the confusion and the sorrow, I would. I can't do it, but I'll tell you what I can do. I can tell them about somebody who can. I can tell them about Jesus. That's why I'm here. I didn't just come here just to entertain people. I don't come to entertain people. I, I've come here to tell you about Jesus, as simple as that. And this is my message. What he's done for me, and what he's done for thousands of others, he can do for you. Oh, you say, hold on, Dorian, hold on. I haven't been a witch. I haven't been anything like that. No, but maybe not. You may have been not been where I've been and done what I've done. But you've never, if you've never been to the foot of the old rugged cross, and if you've never had your sins washed away in the precious blood of Jesus, let me tell me tell you something. You're as lost as I was once. The Bible says so. All sin is sin. There's no such thing as a white line in God's sight. It's all black. There's no such thing as white witchcraft. It's all black. All sin is sin and sin separates man and woman from God. But the Bible says, you know, that if you're lost, you can be found. He said, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. Isn't it lovely? And my message today is simply this. Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. Jesus cares about you. He understands all about you. And he loves you. And if you're bound, you can be free. That's my message. If you're dead, in trespasses and sins, you can be made alive. If you've got burdens, the burdens can be lifted. If you've got sicknesses, you can be healed. My Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. Well, do you know what they told me, the girls on the street, when I witnessed to them? Because they're the first people I went to, the girls on the street. They said, we'll give you six months and you'll be back with us. That was 22 years ago. <laughs> and I'm still going on with Jesus, still growing in grace. You see, not, the, not only does he save, not only does he deliver, he keeps. I'm kept by the power of God. We used to sing it in Sunday school, I have a saviour who is mighty to keep. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven days in a week. I have a saviour who is mighty to keep 52 weeks in a year. Isn't it wonderful? He not only saves, he not only delivers, he keeps and he's kept me all his time. And he's used me for his glory. And I give him all the glory. It's only by his grace I'm here tonight. It's only by his grace, it's only by the mercy of Jesus and I'm here tonight. I've been halfway around the world and back again. Only by his grace. I love his word today. You know, I've worn out about six Bibles. This one's going on. But you know, 
I love every precious word in his book. I love, I love every little two but it's an and. The wonderful buts in the Bible, you know. The wonderful buts in the Bible. But God, who is rich in mercy, in the love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead, has quickened us and made us alive. Wonderful buts in the Bible, and I love every word of the Bible. And I believe it's the inspired word of God from cover to cover, leaving nothing out. And my, I've got a great love for God's Word. And it was there right from the beginning. And it's grown and grown and grown. Today, I have a counselling ministry. I've written three books. The third one is out next month. Uh, no, not next month, sorry, October. Spiritual warfare. That's what we're in. But you know, I've learned something else too. I've learned that the battle is not ours, but the Lord's. And you know, I'm gonna, I, I refuse to get involved in any battles with the devil. If the devil has a go at me, of course he has a go at me. But get on with it. I'm looking to Jesus. Stupid devil. No. People are so frightened of the devil, you know. I think too much of the devil. Oh, the devil's got to go at me again. The, oh, this, this, the devil's got to go at me. Of course I understand, you know, but Christians, you know, mature Christians, they're supposed to be mature Christians, they're always... Oh, they get so down so quickly and so depressed and oh, they don't rely on God's Word and they don't read God's Word and they don't spend enough time in prayer. They don't spend enough time in meditation. That's why they don't get the victory. They haven't got the armour on all the time. You know, when you've got the armour on all the time, you don't have to fight the devil. I'm too busy keeping my eyes on Jesus. I'm, I'm too involved with, with following Jesus, simply following Jesus, to get, refuse to get into any skirmishes with Satan. And that's it. Is a defeated foe. He was defeated nearly 2,000 years ago at the foot of the old rugged cross. When Jesus said it is finished up there on Mount Calvary, he didn't mean I've had it. He meant I've done it, I've done it. He came and he completed the work that his father gave him to do. And what was that work? To conquer the devil. And he conquered the devil nearly 2,000 years ago. I'm not afraid of the devil, I'm not afraid of witches either, I'm not afraid of any Satanists. I don't care if 10,000 Satanists walk up to me, I'm not frightened of them. They threaten my life. They said they're going to kill me. Stupid, isn't it? How can they kill a child of God? It's ridiculous, isn't it? Because if they did kill my body, they couldn't kill my soul anyway. That's stupid, isn't it? I'm not afraid of the curses of a witch. Don't be afraid. You can't be affected by the curses of a witch. Sure, they've got power, evil power, but God's got greater power. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us and gave himself for us, aren't we? Well, either we believe it or we don't. Huh? Either Jesus is Lord or he isn't. Well, to me, it's Lord. It's Lord of my life. And I can take authority over all the powers of darkness in the name of Jesus, no ifs and buts about it. The Word of God says so. It says you can cast out demons, you can tread on scorpions. In my name and in his name today, I rule and reign in life because he rules and reigns in me. He's my king and I love him very much. And I love him more today than I did then. Oh, sure, there's been disappointment. There was rumours going around that I'd gone back to witchcraft. Devil's stupid. He tried to stop me, you see, again. So I shut her up. I put a rumour around and tell them that she'd gone back to witchcraft and they won't listen to her again. The devil's defeated, stupid devil. So I'm still going on. <laughs> Even silly Christians, you know, some Christians have swallowed anything, you know. They believe anything, you know. They even believed it. The devil tried to get me down about that. I tell you, tried to stop me, but uh, he's stupid. He's at it. Because I'm here, still here. And I'm still preaching the same grand old gospel story. I'm still giving the testimony. I'm still preaching God's word. And today I'm helping people who have been in the same situation as I was. I've a counselling centre. I belong to a church.
I'm under the authority of my local church. And, you know, there's blessing in coming under authority, you know. Well, I don't see any bondage in it. Well, you belong to a, a local church. What you, do I love him? Belong to a... Yes. I do. And I love it. I just love it. You know, when I'm not out preaching the gospel, I'm there with them. And I'm, I'm in my little office and I'm, I'm, I'm answering letters from people in need. From depressed people. I counsel them there. And a counseling centre is being developed on the premises. There's more about that in the third book that's coming out in October. Get it and read it. Bring you up to date. No, oh, I could go on and on and on and on, you know, but I just want to tell you that the call to service today is urgent. Did you hear what I said? The call to service is urgent. Whatever we got to do for the Lord, whatever we want to do for the Lord, we've got to do it now. There's no time to waste. There's no time to sleep. The hands of the clock almost at the midnight hour. We are rapidly approaching the time when God's day of grace will cease. And those that are lost are going down to a crisis eternity. Those who know not Christ will be lost forever. Will be separated from God forever. We must rise up and we must work now while we've got the time and while we've got the opportunity. The Bible says the night comes when no man can work. And we've got to shake off the grave clothes of apathy and unbelief and fear and ignorance. And we've got to put on the whole armour of God and keep it on. Don't put it on every morning. Put it on and keep it on. They don't take it off at night. Some people said to me, I put on the armour of God every day. I said, well, great. I put it on and never took it off. Yeah. Well, we must... Put on the, the whole armour of God and we've got to do battle with the devil in victory, with victory. We must meet the needs of all the people around us. We must tell men and women, and we must not be afraid to tell them, boys and girls, that they've only got two choices to make. Christ in his heaven or the devil in his hell. It's as plain as that and it's as simple as that. We must not be afraid to warn them of the devil. We must not be afraid to warn them of the cult. We must not be afraid to warn them of demons and hell. We must not be afraid to warn them of drugs. We must not be afraid of their faces. We must rise up. We must work now. We must shine now for Jesus. And we can. We can shine for Jesus in this dark world of sin. Jesus spoke to me years ago and he says to me, you be yourself and shine for me. You can. You can shine for him in any circumstance. And I believe this, say it's harvest time now. It's harvest time. I want to tell you about a vision I had. That was so real, I haven't forgot it. You never forget a vision like this. I've been in Australia, and I've been there for six weeks, and I was giving the testimony on, on the, on the uh, north of Australia, in the north of Australia, and... Um, uh, and uh, on into Papua New Guinea. And it was wonderful, you know, to see souls saved there. It was lovely. It was wonderful just to lead men and women to Jesus there. And i just come back from, from there. And I was in London. And I was at this conference. And I started to sing this little chorus. I don't know whether you know it, but uh, I sang it and sang it and sang it and sang it. They joined hands and they were singing it just before I spoke. Oh, it spoke to me. It really spoke, gripped me. You know when you hear something that grips you? You know, God speaks to you through it. You know, well, this gripped me. And it goes like this. It's harvest time. It's harvest time. The rain is falling. The Saviour's calling. Oh, do not wait. It's growing late. Behold, the fields are white. It's harvest time. It's harvest time. And he sang it. He sang it and sang it. I sang it and sang it. Tears are coming down my face and... And you know, afterwards um, I, I'd done that meeting, I went and sang it and sang it again and I went out and, and sang it and I sang it in the bedroom and I sang it everywhere. And, and, and I had a vision. And I saw the rain falling, the latter rain. I saw uh, 
hardened men, sinful men, evil men and women coming out of these evil places, out of the covens, out of these evil dens of iniquity, and they're making their way to the foot of the old rugged cross. I saw empty churches filled with people. I saw big men fall on their fall on their knees and, and their tears streaming down their face and people were repenting of their sins. It's going to happen. It's happening today. It's happening today all over the world. Men and women are being set free. The chains are being loosed. I'll put some more words to it. It's harvest time. It's harvest time. Sad hearts are crying. Lost souls are dying. Oh, do not sleep. Rise up and reap. Behold, the fields are white. It's harvest time. Christians, it's harvest time. It's harvest time. And I believe that today we're reaping in a harvest that's never been reaped before. You know, Christ is not coming back for a defeated church. Christ is not coming back for a raggledy taggledy band, you know. Here we come, Lord, you know, just made it full, you know. No! Christ is coming back for a radiant, victorious church. And today, make no mistake about it, make no mistake about it, God is raising up dedicated, separated, consecrated men and women of God. There are no way ignorant of the devil's devices, fully clothed in the whole armour of God. A holy, happy band, a radiant church. Well, I'm glad I belong to the army of the Lord. I put myself there. I place myself in the army of the Lord every day. And I march forward victoriously. Place yourself there. With the old armour of God on. And remember, that's an armour of light. And just, just, just imagine how great the army of the Lord is. I tell you, it's bigger than the army of the devil. It's bigger than the devil's army. He's got an army. But God's got a bigger one. And I'm part of it. And if we all march forward with all our armor shining bright, just imagine how great that light is, eh? Here's a radiant light. Oh, I'm so glad I've changed every muscle. I'm glad. I, I'm excited. I, I want to go on. I don't want to stand still, I want to go on, I want to grow. There's so much more for me to know. So many more truths I can... Oh, I'm excited about it. God's got so much in store for us. You know what the word of God says? I have not seen and ears not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. How much God has in store for his children. But it's revealed to us by the Spirit of God, it goes on. And God is revealing more and more of his truths to me today. Thank God for the infilling, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I thank God for everything that he's given me. And everything he's given me, I want to give away. And the more you give away, the more you get, you see. The more you give to people, the more you get. Oh, I love him very much. I love him very, very much. Nature forms us, doesn't it? Nature forms us, makes us look like what we look like. We're all different. Nature forms us. Colleges, schools, books, universities, they inform us. Sin deforms us. But only Christ can transform us. Christ can transform us. And Christ has transformed my life. What he's done for me, he can do for thousands of others. And I've got a message for the world. I'm rather like old Charles Wesley, you know, he says, the world is my parish. That's how I feel about it. Right? The world is my parish. Let me introduce you to him if you don't know him. If you've got bondages, burdens, look to Jesus. You do it. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of the earth will grow strangely dim. 
in the light of his glory and grace. Take your eyes off of everything else tonight. Off of your burdens, off of your troubles, off of your trials, and fix your eyes on Jesus. Catch a glimpse of him. Just a tiny glimpse. Oh, if men and women will catch a glimpse of Jesus, how different their lives will be. Catch a glimpse of him tonight. He'll do it, whatever it is. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. Was I too hard to reach? Is anybody too hard to reach? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? No. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. I want to do a bit of faith building. No. Fix your eyes on Jesus. He'll never let you go. He'll never let you down. Oh, but the church I go to and the people I've met and the pastor and this and that, I don't care about them. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Take your eyes off of other people. I have to. People let me down. Rotten. But Jesus never let me down. Oh, there's times when tears of disappointment and discouragement have run down my face. But he's never failed me. He's kept me by his power and it will go on. It will kick me till the end. And he'll do the same for you. Just place your life in his hands. Just give yourself over to him. Just fix your eyes on Jesus. And he'll take away the sin and the darkness and his light will shine in and he will set you free. He will set you free. He breaks the power of cancelled sin, the Bible said. He sets the prisoner free. Isn't it wonderful? Oh, I'm excited. I'm really getting excited here. His blood can make the foulest clean. Listen to the word. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood avails for me. Do you know what I love? I love that old Psalm 103. As far as the east is from the west. Well, then that's the universe. We can't measure that. You try measuring it. As far as the east is from the west, so far as removed my transgressions from me, never to be remembered against me anymore. It's cast my sins and my past and all the evil. It's cast it into the depth of the sea. And it's put up a big sign, no fishing. No fishing. You see, Jesus forgives and he forgets. No matter what you've done, no matter what's happened to you, when you come to Jesus, he wipes the slate clean, he forgives and he forgets. Isn't it wonderful? He not only forgives, he forgets. Love Jesus. That's the one I love, that's the one I serve. That's the one I'm speaking about tonight. He forgives and he forgets, he cleanses, he heals, he restores. He mends empty, broken, shattered lives. He's done it for me, he can do it for you. When? Tonight. Now. That's when he can do it. Jesus can do it. He's done it for me. And for thousands of others. I'm not the only one. My salvation is no more important than yours. Did you hear what I said? He's no respecter of persons. My salvation and deliverance is no more important and no more wonderful than yours. If you think that I've got a better testimony, a greater testimony than you've got, then there's something wrong with you, brother and sister. He died the same death. He shed the same blood. He's no respecter of persons. Your testimony, your deliverance, your salvation is just as wonderful as mine. Or have you lost the joy of your salvation? Some people I've met today, many in fact I've met, have lost the joy of their salvation. Never mind, if you've been robbed of the joy of salvation, who's robbed you of it? What did Jesus call the devil? A thief and a robber. And that's what he is. And if you've been robbed, 
Don't worry. Jesus can restore to you what the devil's robbed you of. You know, one young girl I knew in the Satanist temple, I knew her very well. She gave her whole hand to Satan, literally. They just chopped it off at the high altar with one of the ceremonial swords. And they lifted up on a silver platter and offered it to Satan. And they cauterized the severed arm in the limb. She felt no pain. No pain at all. And they thought it was a wonderful miracle because she felt no pain. That girl and others who gave their fingers and toes were maimed for life. What for? Absolutely nothing. What, the, what did the devil do for them? Absolutely nothing. Jesus was right when he said the devil is a thief and a liar and a robber. Jesus mends and he restores. He comes to give life and that more abundantly. So if you've been robbed of your joy and your peace and your rest, remember there is a rest for the children of God. Enter into that rest tonight. Come to know him. Fix your eyes upon him. Let him set you free. Let him do a work in your heart. Tonight you do it if you let him. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, I thank you. You're so wonderful. You're so real. You are the lily of the valley and the bright and morning star. And Lord, I pray tonight that, that you would do a work in people's hearts here. Every heart. That will last for eternity. And Lord, if there's anyone here that is lost, burden, broken, shattered. Lord, I pray that tonight they will look to you, look into your face, come to you, find deliverance, find joy, find peace and trust in you. Oh Lord, snap chains tonight in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I bind Satan, I bind demons in the name of Jesus. In faith, Lord, I, I put a, fort, a wall of fire around this place. Lord, do your work here tonight. Oh, Lord Jesus, just answer prayer. Lord, I pray that you will search every heart, look into every heart, that they may find you, that they may look to you, that they might be saved and delivered and set free. And every Christian, Lord, I pray that you will set in them a zeal and a love you will give them a faith for everything. Thank you, Lord, tonight for the work that you've done and you're doing. In Jesus' name. If you don't know Christ as your Saviour tonight, I want you to, if you want to, I want to do something to help you. I'm not, I don't want Christians to be looking around or anybody to be looking around. I want you to be praying. And if there's anyone with a need, I want you to look straight in me and put your hand up like that. And nobody has to be looking because I'm the only one who's looking. Now if there's anyone I can pray for tonight, you just raise your hand where you are. I see you, God bless you. Anyone else? Anyone else? You want to know Christ as your saviour, you want to be set free? Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. I'll see that hand. Only I'm looking. And Jesus is looking. Perhaps you've never received Christ as your saviour. Perhaps you've never let him in. Perhaps he's still outside the door knocking. Just behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice, have you heard his voice tonight? And open the door. I will come in. Perhaps you've never let him in. Tonight you can let him in. I want to help you with a simple prayer. You pray this prayer after me if you don't know how to pray. And believe. And let Jesus in. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you are alive. I believe that you died on Calvary. And you are alive again today. And I know that I'm lost, dear Lord. And I know that I'm a sinner. And right now, Lord, I 
repent of my sin. I'm sorry for my sin. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, please cleanse me from all my sin and make me your very own child. Snap the chains that bind me. Heal me. Set me free. Give me your life. Help me to live for you. Help me to love you. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you for giving to me thy great and wonderful salvation, so full and free. Help me to live for you from this day forward. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. <coughs> Amen. 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 I don't know whether we know this one in the book here. And it's, um, do not strive. Let me have my way among you. Do not strive. I want us to sing it. Have you got any need, you know? Just let me know. I know there's some out in the other room there. Well, I'm available, you know, and I'm going to be here. And as I'm singing it, you come from the other room out there, and you come here, and I'm going to pray with you. And I, um, Brother Eric, you he help me. See? And we're going to pray for you, whatever that need is. Do not strive. Let Jesus have his way. Let's sing it. 79. Let me have my way among you. Do not strive. Do not strive.
don't strive. Let him have his way among you. Let him do it tonight, whatever that need is, whatever that burden is, let him have his way. Don't put it off. Don't go out of this house, don't go out of that door with burdens, with sorrows, with hardness of heart. Tonight's the time. Tonight's the night for your deliverance. Tonight's the night for your freedom. If you've got burdens, you've had them long enough. If you've got problems, you've had them long enough. If you've been robbed, this is the end. Don't let it go on anymore. Let Jesus have his way. Let's just sing that again. Do not strive. Let me have my way among you. We're going to bring the meeting to an end, but I'm still here if you need prayer. Let's sing that last, that first verse again. Let me have my way among you. already made an invitation it may be that some of you would like to uh, just acknowledge uh, in your hearts now uh, before the Lord because he can reach you just where you are can't he amen but it may just be that there are one or two of you or some of you that would like to have a personal time of uh, prayer and fellowship with Dorian sometimes the deeper problems need just that little bit of extra help and sometimes the problems are quite personal that you want to share and uh, I guess you'll gather from Doreen's testimony that like most people involved in counselling they're pretty unshockable so if you haven't been too far that Doreen can't reach or, uh, or will be shocked by what you have to say you're just a servant of the Lord and she wants to help you tonight and we just praise God for that testimony that we've heard and uh, we're grateful to God for the opportunity we've had together haven't we? and the sweet fellowship and the most important thing is as well is the presence of Jesus and he's just filling his room right now isn't he and he wants to touch you, release you, bless you, fill you, heal you all those things, save you if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior you may have come in, come in tonight just wondering uh, what was going to happen uh, to him go out tonight an entirely different person knowing the real Jesus and we just uh, commit this time to the Lord shall we and uh, commit one another to the Lord in prayer Father we want to thank you and bless your lovely name for tonight you're a God Lord who fills all of our expectations you just ask but one thing that we come with that little scrap of faith that we have we thank you Lord for that anointing upon thy servant tonight we thank you that you indeed have shown to us, Lord, through her testimony that you are the living God and that you're big enough for any situation, Lord. And that there's not one of us in here, in this uh, room here tonight, that is a situation that's too big for you. We pray for those, Lord, here tonight who've been struggling and battling with some oppression, depression, oppression. Some that have been found in the way dark and lonely and isolated. We just love and commit them to you because we know tonight, Lord, it's a night of release. Tonight, Lord, is a night when they can be set free. You've never turned anybody away yet, Lord, and we know you're not going to start it tonight. That whosoever will may come. And so we again just thank you, Lord, for your blessing upon us tonight.
We believe also, Lord, that tonight has been something special in another direction because we've been challenged tonight that there's a harvest field outside and that we, Lord, have indeed been shod with the gospel of peace. And we pray, Lord, that we'll not go back on tonight on the things that you've been saying to us. But, Lord, that we shall have the courage and the anointing of the Holy Ghost to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. We do believe, Lord, with all of our heart that if the church was to wake up and start gossiping the gospel, that this land of ours will be turned upside down for Jesus. And that's our great longing. Lord, that's our great desire. And so we just again, we bless you, we praise you. Thank you again, Lord, for each one of us here bowed in your presence. And we ask again, Lord, for your mighty blessing upon those that have journeys to me. Yes. We ask your blessing, Lord, and we pray indeed that out of tonight, ministry shall rise up for you, that your name shall be glorified. Yes. We ask this in your precious and lovely name, thanking you for it, Lord. Amen. 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 Amen.